evaluation. Although the proof, assuming that the solution is smooth, solution is smooth. So this is assuming nice things. Of course, the linear equation, if you assume the initial condition is smooth, then the solution stays smooth. Uh, and the periodic boundary conditions are and the number uh, boundary conditions. Uh, so this uh, is uh, this type of error estimates have been done for expensive for EG methods. So this is just a si simple example to show you how it is done. Uh, what I said here can also be trivially uh, expanded to nonlinear equations with the same assumption that the solution is smooth. So this part is not difficult. It's more technical, but it's not too difficult. Now, the problem of non-smooth solutions will be different. I will mention that was there, but I will not really try to do anything in this lecture. OK, so for smooth solutions, the error estimate goes in the following way. So first, let's write down the scheme. The scheme is that uh satisfies uh sub t times v dx over i t minus this is f u, but in this case f u is just the u, so it's uh times v x dx plus this used to be f hat j plus half is the flux, but for these kind of conservation laws, you take the flux to be a wind. Then this is just u h minus j plus half v of j plus half minus minus u of minus j minus half v of j minus half plus equals to zero. So this is the scheme satisfied by u h, where test function v belongs to the finite element space v h. So this is the scheme. Now we would want to study. The error, which is the exact solution minus the numerical solution, u minus u h, and we would want to study the L2 error. In other words, the integral of this quantity squared. We want to see how big this quantity is. So towards that goal, the, well, the first thing we would want to do is to establish the so-called <coughs> error equation. There is a very nice property that the exact solution satisfies the same equality. Let me show you why. So the exact solution is ut plus ux equals to zero, right? So zero. So you can multiply it by v, v equals to zero. V here is somebody in the finite element space, but whatever v, we can multiply by right? <laughs> zero. You agree? This is true, right? So I can also integrate zero. No problem. I can also integrate by parts of the second term. Then what do I get? I get the following. I get u <coughs> of vx dx. I get two boundary terms. Now be careful how do I write these two boundary terms. The first boundary term is u of j plus half, v of j plus half, but I need to put a minus here. The reason is that when I do integration by parts, I mentioned this before, and right? I emphasize it again, that you are dealing with things inside this interval. So you are only picking things from inside of the interval. On the right, you pick it from the left. Left, you pick it up from the right. And you do integration by parts. Why don't I need to put a minus here? Well, you could if you want, but you don't need to because u is the exact solution to the original PED. So it's a nice guy. <laughs> it's a assume it is smooth. So U doesn't jump. U H does. V also jumps. V comes from the finite space. So we put the things which is necessary. Minus U of J minus half. V of J minus half plus equals zero. This plus also is because I'm picking up from inside the second integral. That is equality. So let me write this equality here, just on top of. plus u of j plus half, v of j plus half minus, minus u of j minus half, v of j minus half plus equals to zero. 
notation of consistency, let me put a minus here and put a minus here. I mentioned that you don't need to. You could if you want, because u is a smooth function, right? It's minus equals to plus equals to nothing. <laughs> it's point. So I have this thing. So roughly speaking, this first inequality says that the exact solution satisfies the scheme. Right? Because if you compare, it's identical. Only difference is that there's an edge here, there's no edge there. You might be wondering, how can this be true? How can the exact solution satisfy the numerical scheme? Don't you know that for finite difference, you learn finite difference, your teacher will tell you that, okay, uh, you have a scheme here. If you put the exact solution of the PDE into your scheme, it will not be equal to zero. It will be equal to some quantity, and you define that quantity as local truncation. So how come here, if you put the exact solution into your scheme, it is zero? Then if you put the exact solution into your scheme, it is zero. You put a numerical solution to your scheme, it is also zero. Doesn't it mean that you have two solutions to your scheme? <laughs> Why is the exact solution here? Is the numerical solution? Now, how can that be? Cannot be, right? So the dilemma here is that the exact solution is not in your finite element space. The, this equality admits only one single UH in your finite space VH. There's only one UH in the space VH which will satisfy this equality. However, if you go outside your finite element space, there may be more than one. There may be others. In particular, the exact solution will satisfy the equality. But the exact solution does not justify it as a numerical solution because it is not in your finite element space. It is not a piecewise polygon. Right. So that's no contradiction. So you have this, you have this, you use linear energy, so that's why I start with linear equation, things are easier. You take the difference, you get the so-called arrow equation, which is the arrow E satisfies the scheme. E minus g plus half, V of g plus half minus plus E minus g minus half, V of g minus half plus equals zero for any V in VH. Now, this particular equality, which says that the arrow, the exact solution minus the numerical solution satisfies the scheme, this is called the arrow equation. The arrow equation in the linear case is trivial, it looks like the scheme itself. In the nonlinear case, the arrow equation is different from the scheme. The equality, the arrow satisfies. Okay, so now I have, I have this. So recall in the morning, I proved a cell, I proved L2 stability. I proved L2 stability out of this. Basically, what I did was that I took I took test function V to be UH in, let me give them some numbers. So it's one, this is two, this is three. So I, I took V equals UH in two. Then I did some algebra. I proved at the end of the day, DDT of UH squared over two, but that's not important, is less than equal to zero. In other words, UH squared at the L2 norm of UH at the later time, this is the L2 norm, at the later time T is smaller than the initial, the L2 norm of the initial condition like this, like that. So I proved this thing in the mod by taking and the whole business is algebra, right? I just took this and I did some <coughs> algebra and I showed that. But this is the same equality. So if, hypothetically, I could take V to be E in 3, if I could do that, then what do I get? I would get the same thing, right? Because it's just algebra. I would get e squared dx is less than equal to zero 
in other words, I would get E of T arrow at T is less than arrow at zero. <coughs> Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> the spin of the arrow at T is smaller than or equal to the arrow at zero. That'd be wonderful, right? I want that. Unfortunately, I cannot do that. I cannot do that because this equality three is satisfied only if the V is taken from the test function space PH. Otherwise, this equality is not true. So if you take V to be UH, that's fine because UH is indeed in VH, but you cannot take V to be E. E is what? E is U minus UH. UH is in the space, but U is not. Hence, their difference is not in the space of H. So this, you can, unfortunately, you cannot do. But this still gives you a big hint about what you should do in error estimates. The big, the big hint is that, yes, you cannot take V equals E, but can I take something very close to E? Closer the better, but it has to be in the space. Right? So, in other words, a standard technique, standard trick of proving error estimates for finite element methods, e.g. method, is to decompose E, which is U minus UH, into two parts. The first part is U minus somebody in the space. So this, this is the space VH, this is U, this is UH. So I first find somebody which is called PU projection. What kind of, I'll define the projection later, what kind of projection, but the important thing is that this projection is in this space. And then I decompose this big, let me write it this way. I decompose this difference as no bigger than the sum of these two differences. Right? So U minus P U, P U minus U H. The good thing about it, so I can call this to be whatever you can give it any any notation you want. Uh, for example, uh, I can call it eta minus C. So eta here is U minus P U, which is the so-called approximation. For example, I can take this P to be the regular L2 projection. I will explain to you later what the L2 projection is. Or another projection. The idea is that this part of the arrow has nothing to do with the BG spin. It only relates to the space VH. In other words, I have the U here, which is outside of the space. Can I find somebody inside the space which is close to me? <coughs> right? So if my space is big enough, hopefully I can find somebody inside of the space which is very close to me. Okay, so you find this thing. If this thing is only approximation, it can you can open any approximation book. It will tell you what kind of projection, it will give you what kind of error. In particular, for polynomials, you have the book of Sianate, the book of Susan Brenner, who is now in another university in town. She will come next week, I guess, but not yet. <laughs> But so you have the book of Susan Brenner, Brenner and Scott. Then any final element the book will contain standard approximation results. So if you have piecewise polynomials, then what would be the error of this part? Right. So in general, this part, this part for any <laughs> I want to put a quotation without any like that. Any reasonable projection. So in other words, as long as we have a projection which has the property that it reproduces polynomials. In other words, if it is already a polynomial, you project, you don't change it. Definition of projection. Then basically you get this kind of error estimate. Remember, this space is P size polynomial degree K. So this is very reasonable that the error. So this part of the arrow is well under control. And also it has nothing to do with your DG speed. So it's already done in the 70s or maybe 50s, but I've done one last century. 
<laughs> it's, yeah, it's in the book. So you always see that this final element, uh, DG, the papers say the code CRL is book, right? It must be multi decided book. That are people do not even read that book. So <laughs> you know that this results are in that book. <laughs> 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 anyway, so here's eta. Cassine is the one which you want to estimate. But this cassine, <coughs> which is u minus u h minus p u, because I put a minus here, so cassine is u h minus p. This guy is, what is good is that this guy is in the space, right? So you already know what I will do, right? What do I do? You already know what I will do. I will take V to be casine. I cannot take V to be E, but I will take V to be casine in three for the error estimate. And let's see what do I get. <coughs> okay, if you take V to be casine, then uh, you basically get the following idea E is what? It's eta minus casine. This is of x plus eta minus the c minus j plus half, the c of j plus half minus minus eta minus the c minus j minus half, the c of j minus half plus equals to zero. So this is the equality three when I take v to be eta minus c is my notation, and when I take v to be c. So I get this equality. Let me move everything involving c on one side, involving eta on the other side. So I would get on the left side very good things, which I really like. C, c x, x plus c minus. <coughs> Minus C minus. This is when I put all these cases on one side, and then we put all the etas to the other side. So eta t cos dx minus eta cos x dx plus eta minus j minus half j plus half cos j plus half minus minus eta minus j minus half to c j minus half plus. So I still I did not do anything. I simply move everything involving to c on one side, involving eta on the other side. Now, the left hand side, I'm very, 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 very happy. Because the left hand side is exactly what I did in the morning when I was proving cell entropy inequality. See? I took the test function to be equal to UH, and I got this. This is exactly right. I take the test function to be KC, but here it is also KC. So everybody is the same. So I just performed the same algebra as in the morning. The left hand side, the left hand side, after summation over J, the left hand side becomes this d d t of zero to one to c square over two, I think, d x plus some after summation all these things telescope. <coughs> so it's plus some theta, which is a positive quantity. This theta would be the sum of all these small thetas. That we talked about in the morning, or this small theta j, each of them is positive in the sum, is also positive. So left hand side becomes this. Right? Remember? The left hand side, if you don't sum, it is this in the interval ij plus some plus difference. But if you 
the sun, let's assume it's periodic boundary condition or compact boundary condition. Boundary. So the flux is all these appears, so and you get this. This is the left hand side. If the right hand side is zero, I get this very nice, <laughs> very nice. See, but of course, the right hand side is not in general not. Zero. But so now wait a minute. I still have a freedom. What is the freedom? I still did not prescribe what this P is. I can take any P, right? This is correct. So my job is to take a projection which is suited, which suits my purpose the best. So this unfortunately has some art in it. So in the proof, why if somebody proves a suboptimal result, and the other guy proves the optimal result, it's the same scheme. It's just your proof technique. It's not that the scheme for this guy is suboptimal, or that guy is optimal, but the scheme is the scheme. So it's only a proof. So if I take a different P, I would be able to get a different result. So let me here look at the right hand side and then decide what P I should pick so that the right hand side will almost always be zero. It's better if all terms are zeros. If I can decide a P such that all the right hand sides will be zero. That will be the best. But I thought that that's usually not possible. <laughs> so don't even try that. <laughs> you cannot design a PU such that every term on the left hand side is zero. However, I can hit as many zeros as possible. So in particular, I don't like these terms. Because these terms are sitting on the boundary. They sit on the boundary. So if I need to control them, what I have on the left hand side do not have boundary, or not much. Not much. So what well, there is some boundary contribution here, but let's ignore that. On the right hand side, if you have things on the boundary, it's not a good thing to control. You will lose some power of it. So let me insist on first thing, I want eta minus a what? Eta minus to be zero. Is that possible? For every g. So then this will also be true for every g. This means u minus pu and j plus half minus is zero. This is the condition on the projection p. In other words, this is my solution u, this is u, this is the cell i j. Let's say let's take the linear case, p1 projection. I want the projection to agree with the function at the right end from the left. So this is my projection. It is different from L2 projection. L2 projection usually does not agree with the solution itself at the boundary. So I want this condition. This is one condition. If this condition is true, then these two terms will be gone. So I still have, let's say this is just one condition, so I still have k conditions left. I have a k plus one conditions, right? That's a polynomial of degree k. I still have k conditions, so what do I do? Can I kill this term? In order to kill that term, I would need eta to be orthogonal to polynomials of degree k minus 1. Because this is already a derivative. The Kc, remember, is in the polynomial space. The Kc is a polynomial of degree k. So if you take one derivative, polynomial of degree k minus 1. Suppose my projection satisfies the condition that u minus pu times 5 is 0 for any polynomial of degree k minus 1. That will be k conditions. Plus this condition, k plus one conditions. That uniquely determines pu, what I've drawn here. Comparing this with the standard L2 projection, the standard L2 projection is just this equality, which holds for every polynomial of degree k. That will be the standard L2 projection. If I choose PU to be the standard L2 projection, I will not be able to get the optimal arrest. Remember, this is just a proof, right? A, this term is 
what I inserted, anyway, it's very artificial, so it's only for the food. So you could put there anything you want, as long as it will help you in your food. So I claim that if you take this particular projection, sometimes called P minus, put a minus here to fit this minus, it's called the gauss radau projection, that's a lot of names. But basically it says that it matches with the solution at one end, and then it's orthogonal to polynomial degree one, degree low. So if you take this projection, you can show that this projection exists, it's unique, and it has this property. See our nice book. <laughs> so that's okay. So you can use this projection. Then all these three terms will show. Right? Unfortunately, this term survives. If you use the standard L2 projection, this term is gone. This term is gone, but these two terms survive. So it's depending on what you want to do, but these two terms are worse than this term. So I would rather leave this guy there. So, okay, so the right-hand side, if I take this particular projection, the right-hand side has only one term, which is eta t times C. Right? Everything, everything else is gone. So then what do I get? I have left equals to right. And this is positive, so I have the following. Half dt <coughs> of 0 to 1 can see square dx is less than or equal to this. Why? Because this plus some positive value is equal to this. So this itself is less than. From zero to one, we have taken some slow, right? Sorry. <laughs> so, and then, well, there are, for the following, you can do a lot of different things. Let me take the easiest, which is not the sharpest. So, just do it as a. Let me see what would be the, the good thing to do. Uh, let, let's do it this way. Yeah, eta t squared. Whatever you call it, you call this. So then, I'm done. I'm already done. Uh, I should erase. Let me erase this, right? Some problem? Okay, so basically I get half of zero to uh, dbt of uh, the c square. Right, this is uh, Cassie norm squared, the L2 norm squared, uh, is less than uh, eta t times Cassie, right? This is the L2 norm of eta t, this is the L2 norm of Cassie. So you take these two, and so, so two cancels with the two, Cassie cancels with the Cassie, so you get dt of Cassie is less than T, right? But A to T, see how late, well, see how late are you raised? Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you want to say, can you put a T there? Yes, you can, because I did not display it has T, so it's the same. It's the same, same thing. So this guy, So, how does this work? Maybe not the same C. Remember, 
Kazi. Right? Yes. He raised what? The definition of Kazi is this.
Remember, I called it the monotone flux. And this condition actually was proven when I was proving stability. Right? I used this condition when I was using stability to prove the stability. So you wonder what happens to system. So in system, this would also have to be a vector. Flux has to be a vector. Fortunately, again, finite model people took care of this. They defined a lot of so-called <coughs> approximate Riemann solvents. Godanov, HLLC, rho solver, uh, glass bridges, kinetic. So there's a quite a big book by Toro. <laughs> <laughs> So you open the book and then you pick any one you like and you put it here. And then that's your scheme. Right? Because you see the other part of the scheme doesn't care whether it is a scalar or a system, it's just for equation. So the only part which needs change is this F hat, which you can call this book. Unfortunately, of course, the theory breaks down. The theory, the stability, for example, would work, I mentioned in the model would work only for symmetric hyperbolic system. Not a symmetrizable, symmetric. It has to be a symmetric glass bridges system. Symmetric hyperbolic, it can be nonlinear, that's fine. Symmetric hyperbolic system, glass bridges for us, then there's a proof that the same L2, cell entropy inequality and L2 error, L2 stability. Non-symmetric hyperbolic system, unfortunately, no no theory. So, so here is something already different. But you can, in practice, you can compute. Then if you compute, what you will, have, you will see is that it works fantastically for smooth solutions, works very well for solutions with very weak discontinuities, weak shocks. However, if you have a strong shock, then the solution may, break, may blow up, may break, the code may break. The reason is that you can compute them to get a negative density, negative pressure, for example, for gas dynamics, which after a few time steps just blows up. So there is still a problem of using DG scheme for solving systems of hyperbolic conservation laws with strong shocks. So this, even though you have so many nice things to say about it, still doesn't work. So then, people are trying to put in different types of limiters. And this is the place where the state of the art becomes murky and complicated. Not so good. You see, up to now, it's beautiful, right? You agree? <laughs> you cannot criticize me for any part up to now. But from now on, you can criticize me because then it becomes really messy. So uh, the summary, the one sentence summary about the limiters is that up to today, there is no universally accepted limiter. There is no limiter which people all agree that this is the best. So everybody uses his own limiter. This is because no limiter was universally good across all cases in terms of cost, simplicity, and robustness, and lack of parameters to tune, and all these things put into rather than. Yeah. So let me try to explain at least a couple of limiters very briefly, just so that you have an idea of how limiters are applied in the DG context. And these couple of limiters are not claiming they are the best. So it's just that there's no best. So people are still trying to write papers, trying to find good limiters. So this is, in my view, one bottleneck. So it's a DG has several bottles. You say people always ask me, you say things are so good, DG is so good. Why don't everybody use DG? <laughs> Why not the uh, right? So not everybody is using DG. There must be something which is not good. So you're hiding it. <laughs> so uh, this is teaching a course you cannot hide, right? Given the lecture, you say you can only say good things. And then you blame the time that I am going to give them 40 minutes. So I can only talk about good things. <laughs> But yeah, but now uh, it's a lecture. I give you six hours. You have to say something. <laughs> to be honest. Uh, okay. So the bot my bottleneck is this state of the art for limiters is not very mature. 
is not there is no universally accepted <coughs> limiter which people all agree that it's a good use. Oh, let me look at several possibilities. The first possibility is the most original launch could have been G of possible and shoe. And over there, the limiter is directly borrowed from <coughs> in mass, from finite volume. Directly borrowed from finite volume, no change. So by that time, there were already a lot of discussions about the total vibration diminishing or total vibration bounded limiters for finite volume schemes, and that was directly borrowed to Roche Kota DG. So this is how you do it. You first <coughs> first step, you use the regular Roche Kota DG to go from U H N to U H N plus one, but let's say preliminary. Terrible notation. <laughs> so you get this next time level polynomial, piecewise polynomial, but you don't use it for next time step yet. So this is something you put there. You may still need to change it for the preliminary. This I'm I, I'm talking about the room. Let's say. Uh, uh, yeah, root code PG is fine, but what I'm saying would be one step method. So go from, let's say, uh, all forward. So let's say this is all forward. Because root code, you have to do this for every inner stage. So this is describing all forward. So what I have explained so far would bring you from time level n to time level n plus one over to the first Runge-Kutta stage, I call it preliminary. And then second, I apply a limiter to this UH n plus one preliminary, and this result would be my UN plus one. So it's a predictive character type scheme. It's a post-processing. So you first use your regular scheme to match for one time step, get a preliminary piecewise polynomial. Then you limit this preliminary polynomial to get a <coughs> final polynomial. Then you continue. So this way, the coding part at least is not hard, at least conceptually, right? Because if you have a DG code, you just throw in the extra sub routine, which is this limiter. That's all you need to do. So what would you put a condition on this limiter? What would what would be a desired list, desired list of this limiter? You hope that the limiter is uh, first of all it keeps the cell average. Not check. This is crucial. Any limiter should not change the cell average. Should equal to to u h n plus one preliminary b x. So the cell average uh, divided by that, but it's not. That's not better. So the cell average should not change. So polynomial, you can change, but you can only change the variation part. You cannot change the cell average, the mean. This is for conservation. So very sacred, so any limiter shouldn't touch cell average. Second, you want to say that in the troubled cells, in the so-called, well, this is, again, it's a very messy definition. So what do you mean by couple of cells? Everybody has its own criteria to say this cell is not good. So there's a paper by Chu and Li which <laughs> studies as a 10 different trouble cell indicator. And finally our conclusion is that it's not conclusive. So in some cases <laughs> in some cases one was better in the other cases the other one. So this is already a 
unlucky. I mean, it's, it's, so, in, so you suppose you try you find those trouble cells. These are the cells for which the limiter takes effect. The limiter does not take effect everywhere, even though sometimes you do apply the limiter every cell. But most of the time, it is applied, but it does not touch the polynomial. So you just spend the CPU time, but it did not change the polynomial. This should be the case. You see, in across the board, there are only isolated shots. So you, the limiter should be biting only near those places. So in troubled cells, the polynomial should the limited polynomial should be less oscillatory. Be less. Again, this is <laughs> what happened. Now, the good news about this TVD business is that there's a theory behind it. That's the good part. So let me explain what is, how it is done and what is the theory. Two values, but 
At least for P1 and P2, this uniquely gives you a polynomial fact. The reason is that for P1, you can easily see that these two formulas, these distances are equal, so because the straight line goes through the middle point. So the two distances are the same. So these two guys are the same. The limited two guys are also the same. So it's basically for P1, it is like you have the original linear function with this new delta. And then your modified new delta might be only up to here. It can only be smaller. Notice that the limiter will make this new delta only smaller. The min mod is smaller than any member inside the argument. It's the same sign, it's smaller. So it will bring it down a little bit, so the limited polynomial will become flattened. Because this new delta and the new double delta are limited and unlimited, they are both the same. So there is a unique polynomial corresponding to the modified new delta and new double delta. So for P1, this is a uniquely defined limit. For P2, it is also a unique defined limit because then, let's say you bring down this, this is the new new delta mod, and this is the new, that's a different thing, new double delta mod, then you want to find a quadratic polynomial which goes through this new point, this new point, and with this cell average. Well, three conditions you can uniquely determine a quadratic polynomial. So for P1 and P2, this limiter is unique, uniquely defines the modified polynomial. For P3, P4, and so on, this no longer uniquely defines this polynomial. So you still have some freedom. You do whatever you want. So the, what we do in our code is that we set all the higher order moments to be zero. Because once it is limited, the accuracy is already down. So it doesn't pay to keep all the higher order moments. Anyway, so this is the original limiter. This is called the TVD limiter. So what is TVB? TVB is trying to relax. So it's still this formula, only that you change the definition of this M a little bit. So TVB changes this M, changes this limiter function M. So TVB take M delta. So what is M delta? Well, it is either a, just a one. Notice that the M, this min mod, is symmetric with all the arguments. It doesn't matter who you write first. But M delta is not. M delta favors the first guy. So it equals to A1 if absolute value of A1 is less than some constant M times H square. Unfortunately, there's a parameter M here. H is the match size. Otherwise, it's min mod. Otherwise. So this TVB limiter is a small modification of the TVD limiter. It unfortunately has a parameter M. Now, implementation-wise, this limiter is very easy. You can see that the only thing you need to do is to compute these two guys feeding into the M or M delta, and get the two new guys, then get a new polynomial out. That's it. Right? So it's not hard. What can you say theoretically about this limiter? Well, there's a theorem. The total variation of the cell average at the next time level step is less than the total variation at the previous time step of the cell average. This is for TVD. This is if you use the min mod. If you don't use the min mod, you use the modified min mod, then the total variation of the cell average is uniformly bounded. <coughs> and then the T, that's the capital T. Unfortunately, this bound depends on capital T. This is for TBD. TBD. So this thing, of course, is less strong than this thing because this thing can keep continuing and then it is the bound and would be the total variation of the initial condition. This total variation can increase 
a little bit, but not much. So the step you only found the bound is up to your final target as a capital T. So this is the reason that this limit has been quite popular because at least mathematically you can say something. And also it's reasonably simple to implement. Unfortunately, this limit also has its drawback. It has been used, it has been used extensively in the computation, it has drawback. Now, for TVB, the drawback is that it does kill accuracy. So one thing I did not mention is that how much accuracy the facts, right? So suppose you're not smart enough for the trouble itself, you apply it everywhere, or you apply it at the wrong place, does it kill accuracy? Yes, the TVD limit does. So it will, if you compute, you see with a sign initial condition ut plus ux equals zero for p2, it used to get third order, but when you no longer get third order, you only get two point something. So accuracy is lost. So this is for TVB. How about TVB? Well, you don't lose accuracy anymore. However, the price to pay is that you now have that annoying this parameter m there, which you have to determine. If you pick m too small, Let's say m is zero, then you recover TVD, you still lose the accuracy. If you two kick m too big, let's say you take m to be two million, <laughs> then you will always pick A1. A1 is the original unlimited U term and U double term. So you're doing nothing. <laughs> so it's pure zero term. So, so this is a, right? So you have to pick this M. So each time we wrote papers on, say the M is 200, yeah, and then the referee says, how do you know it's 200? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so we are in the scalar case, of course, there's some theory to say that M should be two thirds of the double derivative of the solution at the extreme and so on. So we have some analysis to say the range of M. However, for systems, it's really sort of an art. So we really have to we try and error to find the good M. So this is what people don't like. Engineer, you want him to pick M. <laughs> he will pick M equals zero. It's the safest. But then you lose accuracy. So this is uh, the one limiter. I think uh, I will probably uh, take a break here, and then I will talk briefly about a couple of other limiters and a few other issues, and and then to parabolic. I don't know if I can go to parabolic today, but, but I like this way better. Yes, what's going on? Okay, so let's take a break.